Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 298. That's 298. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. As per usual, if you listen to this via the podcast app, please give it a little five-star review to help people know, know where it is. Spread the word, give it a little share with your little share button on your app, whatever you're using. If you're watching this via the YouTube, obviously smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And if you have any interesting comments, feel free to share them if they're not so interesting probably keep them to yourself or maybe text them to your mom because she might care apart from that this is the number one culture and streetwear podcast in the world um as so ranked by myself and many other fans out there all around the kingdom so sit back relax and enjoy so here we are back in another day and still heart still beating uh mind still racing eyes are still seeing things and yeah, we're surviving, aren't we? Day by day, we're surviving and striving. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably been as as a, as I am struggling with, you know, battling against watching the news, checking stuff. I've done pretty well so far. I usually try and check the news at the end of the day. I try and stay away from any kind of, you know, talk about the pandemic and what's actually going on, COVID-19, Corona this, Corona that. I try and stay away from it at, at least until about 5 p.m that's when i kind of go in and check what's happened because by then you know they've already got all the insights what's happening around the world you can um, see the latest developments if people are contacting some sort of story blah 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 blah. loads of stuff is happening at the same time so you can kind of get a whole picture of the situation by the evening as opposed to the morning times right and um that's worked out pretty well it's don't get me wrong it is a struggle because you're always afraid that you might miss something but for the most part the advice that we had from the beginning staying indoors washing hands staying away from people all that sort of shit is gonna run you well in it in the long run i know i read a study the other day actually about denmark being pretty for pretty ahead of their cases i think they're flattening the curve pretty well in denmark people have kind of abided by the social distancing rules which which can be quite effective because i've read counter arguments that it's not effective it's usually a last measure but denmark has proved that if you are if your citizens or your residents listen and they do abide by the social distancing rules and do kind of stay in and avoid going to public places you can stem the tide it can stem the flow you can stem the, the you know the tsunami of this pandemic but you know it's pretty difficult especially in the densely populated metropolitan city with everybody having their own different objectives their own things to look after it's hard to kind of get people to just sit down and not do anything and people are maybe it's intrinsically part of the whole kind of rush to go and hustle and you know um commuting in the morning running back from work in the evening uh going to meet your friends coming back at night like that kind of constant bubble is probably what's led itself to people just struggling to kind of sit down and chill because for the most part most of the pictures i've seen especially in the uk of people kind of uh, skirting the rules and not really caring have been usually been from london i've not seen people from outside london doing it maybe they are don't get me wrong there's some psychos in newcastle not giving a shit but for the most part it's in the london thing and i guess part of the password is because you know we hardly get a summer as it is in the uk so when you do get a summer you want to take advantage of it and this has probably been one of the nicest weathers that you're going to see for a long time um especially if you know knowing our luck by the time it hits august you know it's going to go completely gray and completely dark so i can understand the need to be outside but you know we're on a strict orders not to and it's one of those things that kind of reminds me of that test they do for i think i remember reading the test it might have been in a oh what book was it it might have been in a john ronson book where you mentioned about the test where they give a kid a marshmallow and then they ask the, that kid oh if you if you don't eat the marshmallow now and you wait five minutes i'll bring another marshmallow and then you know the kind of thing rinses and repeats and the whole kind of goal on it i forgot what it was it was like you know if you it's about i think delayed gratification so they were able to prove that if a kid could have a sense of delayed gratification that it was a big indicator of how successful they'd be later on in life right so if they're telling us okay stay in for now so that you can enjoy the summer later on it is a kind of a delayed gratification test delayed gratification test pardon me and a lot of people are failing it a lot of people are failing they're failing considerably bad and um maybe again it's an accurate representation of who they are as people right they just can't not not they can't not go out it's sort of similar to like you know if you're on a diet and someone in your workplace has a birthday and there's a massive amazing birthday cake right right up your alley carrot cake apple cake double double chocolate chip whatever you like can you um resist the urge to have a slice 
because you're on a diet or do you kind of give yourself an excuse of oh no it's my best friend at work it's my work husband my work sister all this sort of bullshit and then you kind of dig in I think that's a good indication and I bet you there are parallels between the people who take a take a bit take whatever's given to them at work for free you know sometimes if you work in a kind of co-working space there'll be someone who'll come in with a promotion with some shitty new Lucozade or some new brand of peanuts and be like oh these are free peanuts and they'll offer them up to you are you the person that takes any kind of free um you know uh, snack or confectionery good or any kind of weird you know um trinket that you're gonna that you're never gonna use like a beer bottle or like a you know beer cap bottle open a shape like a bit of hand cream if you are you're most likely the person that's also gonna go outside during a lockdown and so far um we haven't really felt the effects i think i don't know maybe we could, we'll see it later on we'll see a little bit more of a peak but it does there are some encouraging numbers coming out from different places that are probably making people feel a bit better but um yeah it's been an interesting one it's been an interesting one again i'm not seeing a lot of it because i'm not in the most trendiest of areas so i'm assuming in other areas people are a little bit more loose with the rules and probably you know fucking around and not really giving a shit but where i am it seems like people are kind of hunkering down abiding by the rules for once so they can enjoy the rest of their summer and some people just probably are just taking advantage of it anyway right you get a chance to especially if you've been furloughed at work which essentially means you get to work for free, right? You get to work getting paid without doing anything. That's great. And if you're somebody that is working, you have the also the luxury of not having the stress of coming back home. And because I'd imagine that would play a role in it. Even if you're digging dishes in the road, right? Or you're a construction worker, or you work as a cleaner in a hotel, and you're always short staffed, and you're so you're always tired, and your back is hurting. I'd imagine your commute or your overall job satisfaction would be a lot better when you come back home and you don't have to like squeeze into a train with everyone's sweaty bodies you don't have to like maneuver and try and jump on a bus when it's really full and jump in the back door and have the driver shout at you for the intercom and you're not having to fight people in tesco's to get your last meal deal all those things will affect you let alone you know what i mean like put to one side your your job actually being stressful itself but i'd imagine all those extra bits would actually would actually add to the level of stress or so maybe those people working on service jobs have a shitty day maybe are probably in a really good state of mind now because they're not having to deal with all the other extra shit right um maybe the kind of weird mind fuck that they get from like comparing themselves to other people it's just them their them and their people kind of traveling on public transport which should help for the times i've been outside running in the morning all i see are fluorescent jackets really or for the most part of the buses going by me when i'm jogging in the street so it does it does go to show that maybe there is some kind of correlation in that you know sometimes people's joy satisfaction doesn't come necessarily from just what they do it's the things that surround it but who knows who knows um let's get into some topics i've got a lot to talk about loads of cool internet culture uh stuff bookmarked some stuff on dance music a couple you know street where adjacent news bits and bobs and then we'll let you go on your merry way so first bit of news here i thought i'll touch upon um touching upon the whole COVID-19 thing is um this interesting case of USC 249 right so uh Monsieur Dana White appeared on I think it might have been ESPN and he essentially kind of uh gave his reasoning or his rationale as to why he thinks this um to why he thinks 249 will go on and why you know they're, they're doing everything they can to make it work now I've made my feelings known you know I think it's a ridiculously stupid idea I think if they unnecessarily um, put in the fighters' lives in de- no, put in the fighters' health in jeopardy, it's only lives because you know for the most part, it's only affecting a certain uh, population, a certain group of the, of a certain subsect of the population, right? Fair enough, but you're putting the health, uh, you're putting people's health at risk who are associated with UFC. You know the backroom staff, the people in the teams. The, some of maybe some of the media people everyone attached to it is essentially um is going to be uh, a little bit more cautious and wary and they're just in a position where they have unnecessary stress right you don't need to have this event now i think most sporting organizations or leagues wherever they are professional or not have postponed their or have put a pause on their current season and they're kind of reviewing it as they go and i think i read a report i listened to a podcast someone mentioned it about football or soccer as you might call it in america where instead of cancelling the entire season they're waiting more developments from the government because they if they cancel it then they'd be legally obliged to pay back money for tv rights and it all gets into a completely messy sort of legal battle so legally in terms of kind of uh, covering their asses they have to ensure that they've run through every 
they've, they've have to make sure that they've kind of exhausted every option apart from just banning it apart from just cancelling it straight away they have to go through a list of into all the options and then if there's no if the last resort comes to cancelling it they'll you don't be surprised if you see all the leagues italy spain england um, Holland, Germany, don't be surprised or France, don't be surprised if you see the entire like, Portugal, all those leagues at the same time decide to postpone their season until next year or avoid it, you'll see it happen back to back to back to back, it'll be a thing that happened a concerted effort, but obviously the UFC is run a little bit more cowboyish right, Dana White the president is essentially the leader, he calls the shots, he arranges the fights, he pays the fighters, he probably chips in with terms of marketing and what they do in terms of uh promotion and who gets the big storylines and who gets the features he's very integral to the way the ufc kind of functions as the business or as an operation or as a sporting government sporting body whatever you may call it and he's been very adamant from the beginning of this coronavirus epidemic or pandemic sorry that he would he's not in a position to stop or cancel any of the fights he's postponing them he's very clear to stress this postponing postponing and he's going to make sure that every fight went on in his rationale because he went to make sure he's feeding his fighters, giving them money, putting money in their pocket and making sure, you know, the UFC is the first. And I think his main objective is to make sure he's the UFC is the first sports organization to put an event on during the, you know, the pandemics in full swing. I think they did a one before in Brazil, but that was when it was still people weren't really aware of what the situation was. It was behind closed doors. Um, no one really watched it, I don't think, for the most part. You don't really hear much talk about it. But, you know, it was a bit eerie to watch, you know, as a fan of the UFC. But he's been very adamant that he wants to be the first book organization to be, you know, back up and running, which is probably just his ego. And it also, it, it could be his ego and it could just be the fact that he wants to show off to the other, um, what are they called? the main people at national football teams right who are really powerful right so that will kind of get him in good stead with them they'll see how he runs his business and that he doesn't really care and that he kind of goes hard for his fighters and all this sort of shit it, it makes him in a good light if it goes through and everything goes fine it makes dana look amazing because he's able to put the event on get a spectacle on put distracting from what's going on around the world and kind of you know um reinvigorate everything and he kind of laid bare the entire plan, mostly due prompted because he got trolled by a fake Ariel Hawani account. But he's basically given a bit more information on it. And again, I'm still not a fan of it. I still think it's unnecessary. I still think it doesn't make any sense. But, you know, by now it's too late to really be complaining about it because it's going to go forward. But it's just interesting to see the lack of dissenters out there really speaking about it out loud, I guess, because everyone's used to Dana White's antics. But. It's just not something that you would want to see, right, from any acting president that's kind of leading an organization. But this is the article here from MMA Fighting. The headline says the following. Dana White's COVID-19 plan, two, whites, two months of weekly fights, UFC 249 location. Da, da, da. So the following. Um, as much as the United States and the world uh, shelters in place... Uh, to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, the UFC scheduled regime, uh, resume starting with UFC 249. That's according to UFC President Dana White, who outlined a bold plan that includes da, 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 weekly fights and a private island and a long-time commentator, Joe Rogan. Which is interesting because you don't hear that much from Joe when it comes to Dana White. He keeps his, uh, his opinions to himself. You know, Dana White's had a very um, checkered history with, you know, none other than Brendan Shaw, one of his best friends. Um, he pays the fight is notoriously really shitty. Uh, the Reebok deal was a bad deal in, you know, in retrospect and and when it got signed in, uh, to be completely honest and generally he tries to stay away from kind of commenting on his friend's personal life so you don't really hear much of him saying anything about him but it must be weird position to be with your John Rogan where you have a friend that by large most of the fighters don't have a good thing to say about especially if they're on his bad side but you know that's neither here or there um in the Monday interview TMZ which followed the announcement of the UFC 249 new headliner um and the co and the 12 fight card which is a really good card to be fair the April 18th pay-per-view event White kept the location of the event under wraps as he has since uh question uh uh, as he has since questions of its availability swallowed on the media but he said the venue is set and he's setting up shop here for two months which is similar to the plan that they had for football the plan that was being floated around at the time which has kind of been uh dismissed and kind of put to the side was that they were going to have this kind of uh festival of football sort of thing right where they essentially each major sports league so england spain uh italy germany maybe Portugal, Holland included, right? All the major European leagues would essentially host all the matches in one location. Primarily, it would be like the national teams, 
athletic centre. I forgot what our one's called. We got one here in the in, in the UK for the England national team. It'd all get hosted there, state of the art facilities, great football pitch, blah blah blah. All behind closed doors, and all the teams would be situated somewhere around that area. I guess hotels, and there'd be you know um, coaches that would take them to and from there. So similar to like what they do at the Olympics, right? Where everyone stays in the Olympic Village. There's no going out of the Olympic Village. You tr- you could you train, you compete, you go and sleep, rinse and repeat until the the matches are over. But that kind of got poo pooed, obviously, because logistically, you know, maybe you could do it with the UFC if you've got a card of if you've got twelve cards, two pe- two people per card, you know, plus the team members. Let's say on each card you have maybe ten people that are going to be trying to put there. It's not that bad, but having twenty two players per match plus the medical team plus all the other extras just wouldn't work out the same way it does the UFC. So maybe that's the point of it, but. It was an idea that wasn't really flowed out. Well, and again, I just think looking back at it, that maybe if you analyze it, the reason why the the Premier League didn't go through with the idea wasn't because they were trying to protect the health of the players or the or the teams. I mean, the players or the viewing public, because I'm sure it, once they put that thing on, some supporters are going to go down. They just be fucking nutty, you know, and turn up and cheer their team on as they probably should because they're fans. They want to abide by the stairway kind of rule, whatever. Of course, I'm sure they'll have a police cordon sealing it off for a particular distance but there'll definitely be people there but um i do think that the reason why the premier league probably didn't put it on was because they were more worried about their liability right they're worried about being sued if anybody contracts it or gets the disease and suddenly now you know you're in a whole different situation you're having to fend off a legal case from people that came and watched your event on the basis that you said it was fine to attend you know between lines because you put it on the first place so maybe that's why they did it it wasn't an altruistic thing it was just a pure greed thing they don't want to waste unnecessary money especially during a time when they're not receiving any gate receipts they're not selling as much merch that wouldn't be better to go about things so maybe because Dana White is running the UFC ship by himself he can steer them in any direction that he wants to because it's his company um, for lack of a better term right of course there's other investors in it but he's the one kind of calling the shots Um, so it says here um, White said the UFC's temporary home will host U- US based fighters. Da, 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 da. So here it says from the beginning. So let's, because there's too many of these fluffy pieces. Let's see the actual quote from him. It says the following I'm also a day or two away from securing a private island, White said. I have a private island that I've secured. We're getting the infrastructure put in now. So I'm going to start doing the international fights too with international fighters because I want to be able to get international fighters, all of them, into the USA. So I have a private island and I'm going to start flying them all into the private island and doing it fights from there we have all our planes and everything so that's a obviously an ambitious goal i think i read somewhere that this fight 249 is going to happen somewhere in la or california it's going to there's some sort of indian reservation that they're going to um use um that's obviously going to help them and then i'm assuming the next cards 250 onwards would then be on the island people will go to which again is a wacky idea it reminds everybody of more combat but again like if this go, if it, if he's able to pull it through, you know, I guess it makes him look good, does it? I'm not too sure. Um, will the other sports organizations give a shit? Would they be like, oh my god, I wish we could do the event? Probably not, because they are more aware, they're more cognitive of the damage it would do to your reputation, to the brand long term. You don't want that kind of stain on you. And I guess maybe if you're Dana, you might be, because that's the thing, which is confusing. Because on one hand, Dana's like he wants to legitimize the sport, right, and have it. On the set, have it thought of on the same level as NFL, NHL, NBA, baseball, whatever it may be called in the US. But that's never going to happen because most of the people, they probably view MMA or UFC as simply just barbaric sport. And that's that's most of the boxing fans are like that, especially the ones in the States. I think European fans have the ability to kind of, you know, watch both things. But I think in the US, there's very, very much just split between two different camps, right? Martial arts and or combat or yeah mixed mixed martial arts and uh boxing the traditional way um in the uk we kind of tend to be fans of both easily or you know maybe not a fan of either um but i don't think it's going to necessarily have the effect he thinks it's going to have on the commissions i don't think anyone's going to be that impressed that he's able to do what he wants with his um, organization he does run at the end of the day right he's the one that cuts the checks um so that's not necessarily that impressive and again i just think if just imagine the press if just one person ends up falling ill that's just not worth the hassle really is it um, especially if you have because i think some of the reservation was that he didn't want weirdos calling up and maybe quite you know 
get him getting swatted and having you know people calling fake bomb threats people protesting but people have very strong reactions or strong beliefs attached to this whole uh COVID-19 thing um and it's not like some it's not like some willy-nilly thing that happened right it's a unprecedented incident that we don't really know how to deal with and everyone else took precautionary measures just to cover their asses of course and also to make sure they don't get themselves into any unnecessary trouble right um which is the same thing but you know they didn't want to open themselves up to any potential lawsuits no one wants that but again maybe he's got himself covered maybe he has he's lawyered up to a t we don't know and it continues here another quote from him he says um khabib was caught in the middle of this thing as the world continued to change day by day and i was trying to book venues he says it's not khabib's fault it's not anybody's fault this is something you could never prepare for plan for or even dream of that is possible well it is someone's fault isn't it? it's definitely yours you kept them you strung them along all this time you made khabib blue cut weight going to training camp only for them to continue putting a fire on having everyone in limbo booking people in last minute.com securing an island it's just an unnecessary thing like he could have easily just postponed this until the island was set in stone and it was sorted and then held the khabib and tony ferguson fight there and that could have easily happened too but he's so hell-bent on making sure they catch up on all the fights they didn't want to do that which is you know a bizarre way to do things i think there might be actual um thing here that she speaks about a little bit more but i think that might be it what do you say and then the last bit here quote says everybody is getting going to be pre-tested tested and tested we're going to make sure that 100 percent healthy athletes healthy athletic commission people healthy judges and my production people that everybody there is healthy we're going to make sure that everybody is safe before driving and for during after the fights interesting isn't it? but it does make sense it does echo a lot of what trump is saying because him and trump are friends in it right so trump is really on this whole like wanting to reopen the u.s back for business right get people back to work um you know celebrate easter it's a strange reaction to have to something to have to have um when it's something when it's i don't know it's a strange reaction they're treating it like a like a like a this what you call it like a comp not competition but as a way to kind of demonstrate their masculinity right as like oh we're real men real men you know can fight against anything we're gonna fight this disease it's like you're not fighting anything though by saying these words or by putting on events like it doesn't necessarily make you a wuss or a pussy because you don't want to go because you're afraid you might catch something you're afraid you might you know put other people's lives in danger you're not any less of a man because you decide to stay in or you heed the advice of the medical department now again if this is just like a him being entrepreneurial and pushing the envelope and not and having a reality distortion field similar to what steve jobs had when he used to you know if you read the steve jobs, steve jobs autobiography by walter isaacson you'll hear about him mentioning the steve jobs reality distortion field where he set you know um unrealistic um deadline goals for production of or feature updates or you know design changes right and the whole idea behind it was to push his team until to the point that they didn't know they could get pushed to right so you're essentially saying you know it's like a personal trainers and you're doing 10 push-ups they always make you do five more right and lie so that you can at the end of it you uh, develop um the resilience needed right to withstand not just your prerequisite set numbers or reps of exercises but also any other thing that gets chucked at you so maybe it's a long term it's a quite clever idea but short term i think it's a bit dumb opens them up to like stupid um lawsuits and all that sort of stuff but you know this is dana man he doesn't give an absolute he doesn't give a flying toss about anything so might work out for them in the long run but let's see um and I think the card is confirmed as well, isn't it? I'm pretty sure the card itself is confirmed. Let's see if I can find it here. I think they might have it on their site actually. Listed the entire thing. So yeah, that's that's the entire lineup of the card for QC two four nine next week. You got Tony Ferguson just engaging for the interim belt. So if, if Tony wins, you'll be two time interim champion, which is quite funny. But if Tony loses against Justin Gage, which is entirely possible too, he then loses the chance to fight Khabib. So, you know, fight fans don't win because you don't get to see the fight then again for another two years or something. Jessica Andrade versus Rose number Junis, which would be an absolute hellraiser. Vincent Luque versus Nico Price, that would be a banger too. Loads of bangers, actually. Stephen, uh, Jeremy Stevens, sorry, versus um, Calvin Qatar. Nangana versus um, Rosenstruck. <sighs> definitely get, definitely make sure you are awake for that one because that's not going to go on for five or three rounds. No way. 
Uriah Hall versus Ronaldo Souza, Greg Hardy versus um, Jorgen de Castro, Alexander Hernandez versus Omar Morales, Marlon Vera versus Ray Borg, another good one. So loads of really good fights. So let's see what happens. Of course, you know, I'm against it. I don't think it's an actual good idea, but as most fight fans are out there, you know, it's not, we don't run the company, but we're definitely going to watch the fight. So let's see how that runs true. Okay, let's move on. What else we have here? We have a nice article from, this is a newsletter on Substack written by Sean Reynaldo. I found him on in Twitter actually, and he kind of speaks a little bit about um, the future of dance music, what's going to go on post COVID-19, right? Trying to kind of guess and estimate as to what um, the climate or the landscape will be like, which is quite fun, isn't it? We don't necessarily know what's happening. Things are changing day by day, but we can kind of, um, speculate and have a bit of fun with what's actually going on so this is a really good newsletter that he kind of puts out i'm assuming bi-weekly i'm not sure how how often he writes them but it's on substack it's um all one word first floor dot substack dot com you can kind of um include your email address on there and you will get those sent directly to your inbox this is number 32 first floor and it says techno in the alternate timeline um it's a the, 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 so uh, oh, it's a weekly uh, newsletter as well so I'm Sean Reynaldo the weekly uh, first was a weekly electronic music digest that good news and my favourite new tracks cool anyway so this is a, how it starts off it says on my mind a few weeks ago I was asked to write something about what electronic music will look like after COVID-19 pandemic is over although it sounded like an interesting sort of thought experiment I ultimately wound up passing on the assignment partly because I haven't been feeling terribly inspired to write um while the world is tittering on the edge of collapse, but mainly because I was hesitant to write something that would essentially be a totally speculative piece, which I enjoy doing myself. For what it's worth, um, I'd love to read this article, assuming that someone li less literal than me was willing to take it on the chin, or to take it on, sorry. At this point, we really have no idea what the world is, let alone the electronic music landscape is going to look like when the pandemic is over. Right now, much of the industry seems to be hoping that things will go back to normal within a few months. But the longer this um, crisis drags on, the more that seems like wishful thinking. There are just so many unanswered questions. When will clubs open? Which will which will even be financially be able to open? Um, when will people have the money to go out and party? And if so, will it be safe for them to cram into confined spaces and dance a night away? Will international travel DJs be afforded? Affordable or even possible? Will promoters be able to pay anything approaching to the fees that they were paying before? And where all festivals fit into the picture and how the hell are people going to be able to afford tickets to keep them available so this is all really good question so let's go, go through them one by one right um because i think this is quite a good way of posing it so when will clubs reopen i think that's again something that someone like Adina white isn't abiding by but i guess the common the easy answer for that one is that it'll reopen whenever the government says we can reopen right whenever it's safe to reopen most businesses will reopen because even though clubs probably are way down the list of kind of requ way down the list in terms of uh, required to open, right? Um, we can probably get by with not having a club open again for maybe the end until the end of summer. No one really needs it. It's not like, you know, it's not an essential service in that respect. But it will have a trickling down effect. If one business opens, the clubs can then justifiably, justifiably plead their case to their local councillor, uh, mayor, member of parliament whatever it may be right so whenever they decide to put the green light and say hey you guys can go again we'll go again so that would be happening so that's not really something to worry about i don't think for the most part what is most part what is mostly what people should be worried about the most when it comes to electronic music is like you mentioned before or in this article is the mindset that people will be in like what damage or what kind of changes in consciousness and habits and kind of just the outlook are people going to have once they step back into the you know quote unquote civilian population are people still going to be the same we don't know um is it gonna are they gonna demand different things we don't know so is that is what that's what people should worry about not when they're open open when they're safe so the second question which clubs will be financially able to open again of course unfortunately for us 
um the ones that are especially of us that like underground music the ones the clubs that are, have the most financial backing will stay alive longer right the clubs that have backers who have vested interests in other parts of the nightlife industry will essentially make sure that those places are still able to function once the lights are on because i'm sure some of these people if whether they're investment um uh whether they're hedge funds people whether they're investment bankers whether they're just you know people that have dough they'll they're probably of the mindset that once everything is back to normal there's going to be a fervent desire for people to just burst out this burst out of their front door and run to the nearest place that sells alcohol and get crazy right so they're probably thinking hey if we weather this storm we're going to see the returns tenfold um once everything reopens again people are going to go crazy they're going to be spending like mad they're going to buy t- they're going to book a table they're going to uh, book a booth they're going to order everything off the menu they're going to tip really well they're going to bring all their friends and family everyone's going to put something in the cloakroom they anticipate that kind of level of interest so that's one thing on the other side of thing i guess the mid to low level clubs the ones that are like let's say 800 people downwards or maybe let's say 500 people uh, capacity down are the ones that are going to suffer the most because they they were kind of doing they had their foot in the commercial world and also in the underground world they were booking people just from the strength of their recommendations of friends or like contacts and they were also going for debate so sort of like ra featured people or people that are on the top 20 list of djs around the world so they were wasting some money on the djs that were booking the big ones because sometimes a fee far exceeds what they probably make in a night especially when it comes to the operational cost and then on the other side of the road as well they were putting themselves in trouble by not um by booking underground djs who didn't have a didn't have a pool who didn't really have a bit of an audience who were putting on events and no one was turning up there and then you're losing money on that side so those places will suffer um a lot so i uh, don't be surprised if you see a real um mismatch of places still open right there'll be a really weird cluster of places open and not open don't be surprised to see that also don't be surprised if none of them underground none of the mid-level to low-level places are open at all don't be surprised if only the big dogs the fabrics the print works i don't know all these other weird places are open as opposed to any others don't be surprised that could also be a thing so get have your mind ready for that one but i think the programming is what's going to actually change mostly i think going forward just through just pure necessity not through um, people being um about the culture and all that sort of shit no that won't be the thing so it continues here um will people have the money to go out and party that we're not too sure about it depends on what it depends on how you view it if you if you it depends on how you interpret the people no the view yeah it depends on who's actually going to these events if the people going to the events are mostly people that work in the service industry you know it's a wrap but i'd assume most of the people that go to these especially some of the kind of deep house tech house sort of events they're mostly people that work in offices right mid-level execs who are probably in a position where they can work from home so they're getting paid or they're on furlough so they're getting paid even for not working or they get maybe done then they get a little package a little severance package so they get some money to tie them down and they are you know going out is intrinsically part of their identity it's part of what they do right they go out on a thursday on a friday go to a festival that's what they do they like to spend any extra money they have on experiential events with their friends and family so that should be fine but if your customers are mostly service people service industry people who work in like you know entry level positions and downwards who earn maybe let's say between let's say under twenty three thousand pound a year they, those people probably won't be able to come to your events so again it's up to how they promote it are these events going to be free um are they going to be donations are they going to be all ticketed are they going to book deep those are things that are more important but it depends on your audiences if your audience is tech house deep house people who like to wear sunglasses in the rave they're going to be fine they've got office jobs they work with, they work some receptionists estate agents chartered accountants all the people they'll be fine the rest of them is going to be a bit shaky um and it says here and if so will it be safe for them to be crammed into a confined spaces and dance from that away probably not and that's why again i'm pretty sure that we're going to see an abundance of especially the weather keeps if especially the weather keeps the you know at this state nice and sunny not too you know not too uh not too hot nice cool breeze don't be surprised if we see the advent or the regeneration of loads of those kind of forest raves that i went to a couple of years ago in hackney and all those kind of places and once a park there'll be an, an abundance of forest raves probably done a little bit more probably with a bit more polish them not as kind of you know brick and brick and dy the other ones i went to because you know they, they attract a certain audience again i'm for it i love it but your regular 
general average Joe isn't probably willing to wade through shit and jump over a hill to go to a ferocious rave. They want something that's a little bit more easy, right? That just peels off the kind of beaten track, but you can kind of get to easily. There's a couple shops near it, all that sort of shit. So it's sort of like a kind of a fake outdoor rave, right? That's sponsored by a big company. So don't be surprised to see those. Don't be surprised to see loads of open air events in general around town. Don't be surprised to see loads of kind of um, what's that thing they do in in the Star Beth? Where they have like that kind of like little carnival-y thing on the side road outside. Don't be surprised to see loads of free parties. So those will be okay. No, sorry, the outside things will be fine because there'll be loads of room, and it'll also be I think a really big spike in the warehouse parties. So you'll see a lot of people putting on events in unconventional spaces. Now, obviously, it's still buildings. Don't get me wrong, but they're not like quote unquote built to house a club of night. They just end up. I don't know a photo studio or something so that'll be a big thing happening i reckon going forward because people will be a bit more worried about you know the space they're keeping so which will again help it which will then put in favor the big venues at like the e1 all these kind of places they'll be fine for that because you know they've got you know acres and acres of room and then another question here will be will international djs travel will international travel for djs be affordable or even possible probably not and i think it's a good thing i think far too I've, I've railed against it again selfishly from my point of view being an up-and-coming or being an inspiring dj in my side of things i would much prefer if we had a club culture that kind of encouraged resonance right encouraged longer sets from local djs or local artists encouraged cultivating a, an army or like a collective or like a crew of really talented people that you can kind of rotate week in week out and then you can kind of build their name up and allow them to kind of, you know, um, put, um, spread the sound of your city into different places around the world. And then you can kind of supplement, and you can kind of add to that by bringing in some big acts to kind of, you know, be the cherry on top of the cake, but not to hold up the entire night. I don't think that's really cool. So now you're, weird, you're in this weird position where there's really loads of really cool, there's also really good people who are on the low level who don't have any, they don't play, they don't play out that often, maybe once, and like maybe twice every three months or whatever maybe which is obviously not enough to get really good at it but then they, they're good enough to play out but they don't play often and then the people that are playing often are the ones that are charging the most which doesn't help the places that they're playing in so just for pure necessity and because they just they don't have the money don't be surprised to see a big uh, shift in promoters like you know really kind of beating a dead horse about oh we're, we're promoting this local person she lives around the corner they're only two miles away from the location of the site one of our close friends <laughs> don't be surprised to see all that kind of faux camaraderie around cultivating underground artists which again i'm for i don't care if it's faux or not i just want it to be seen but that will happen for a while until the scene gets back on its feet don't you want you know the bigger acts again it depends on how they work their contract they might be in a situation where the agent put a stipulation in there you know this is an act of god there's no way they can cancel an event that person still has to get booked for another one it kind of, they've kind of owed it but don't be surprised to see the first few ones to be mostly um for the people you don't know loads of label friends loads of friends of the promoters the promoters themselves you know blah 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 blah. they'll call in favors to get that done because they just want to have it open and again i think for the public it should be fine i don't think you'll notice that much of a difference if you have somebody local playing or somebody that's part of the team of the people that are putting it together um, they're probably still of a good standard regardless anyway uh, and then the question here will promoters be able to pay anything approaching the fees they were paying before definitely not and again I think it's a good thing I think we got far too often especially when you look at some of this especially on Friday I think Saturday Sunday is different I think Saturday Sunday usually is the maybe even during the week Monday to Thursday too is probably the times when the actual experience ravers go out and when you look on RA you'll see a list of kind of events and you'll see all the usual big names and stuff but usually on Saturdays it changed so I think that was getting a little bit too you know commonplace um there was a lack of kind of experimentation lack of taking risks everything was too yeah everything was too safe everything was too vanilla um and again those events probably suffered right booking the same person again again to play somewhere not changing anything up um going through the tried and trusted method of kind of drumming up fake kind of hype about something no one cares about that would inevitably catch up on you and i think it did with um with the dj culture so i think for the most part the paying the obscene prices in paying won't go up and also you have to assume a lot of the bigger acts anyway are gonna be desperate just to play regardless right they're gonna um, they're gonna be uh desperate for some stage time so they don't be surprised to see a lot it'll be, it'll be twofold there'll be a lot of underground people playing and it also might be an abundance of the overground people playing the commercial guys because they might lower their fees just so they can get the sets and reps in playing in front of an audience so that'll be a weird thing to see happening um 
and then it says here um well festivals fit into this picture and how the hell are people going to be able to afford them uh tickets um so this one's a weird one because i don't um be able to afford ticket the tickets to keep them alive this one i think is weird because i think personally because I, I, I think a lot of people are a bit negative on festivals but i think by and large most people tended to choose going to a festival as opposed to going to a club night in a ra- in, in well, a club night in a nightclub somewhere because they got more bang for their buck right and obviously it was a little bit more of a buffet way of kind of enjoying electronic you know, music as opposed to specifically going to a club night and not like because a lot of people when they go out i think for the most part there is probably 20 percent of people when they go out don't necessarily know no know where they're going and they specifically don't see somebody i think the wide majority of people go to a location that they don't that they probably don't live far from or that's got easy good transport and then they try and find somewhere that kind of fits what they like and they hope for the best that's it as long as the price ticket the entry price isn't that high they're going to give it a go and then there's there's a small sliver of geeks and dum-dums like myself who you know are obsessed about looking at the lineup and seeing who's playing and what time they're going to appear on blah blah blah, blah. we're the ones that go specifically for nights but the ones that keep those places alive are the eighty percent, right? They're the ones that pay the bills, they keep the lights on. So, I think that whole crew kind of saw festivals as a great way to kind of circumvent all that. Um, you can just go to Love Box, you can just go to Field Day, go to Junction, and essentially you're kind of covered as long as you like most of that music. What that's coming, that point in the direction, you'll be fine. You're not gonna necessarily have a bad um, experience there. So. I think people will make the necessary sacrifices needed to pay for festivals. And I think if you look at it, like, you know, Junction being a good example, the Friday ticket at Junction is like 60 to 80 pounds. They have, uh, let's say, anywhere between 12 to 24 DJs playing on one day, right? That's already way much, way better value for money than it is going to like a Corsica Studios, right? Paying for 20 quid to get in, then paying for drinks, then putting your Coke room in then paying for more drinks da, 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 da. by the time you've left the place you've already probably spent 100 pounds right and you're only going to a place for four hours well, <laughs> well the junction is usually the whole day right you get there from the afternoon you leave sometime late in the evening so you get a lot more bang for your buck so i think people will make the sacrifice needed to go to those kind of events so it's going to be a really difficult place to navigate of course if you're an operator if you've got a club if you're intrinsically a part of making those things happen putting the deals together maintenance team it's going to be difficult to navigate but i think in large i think it will be a good thing for this culture i think we needed a reset things are going a little bit too much in the commercial side of things especially the places that were they're quite underground but they were booking loads of really big names to play there it was really strange i never really understood that um so hopefully we'll see a return to a more local community driven side of things i think that's where we really thrive in london personally i think so i think we really thrive because we have everyone knows somebody that can dj everyone knows someone that can dj really well um when they are playing they're really into their stuff um um yeah and i think we we just probably have the best kind of variety of them out so i think there's no excuse for you know for continually booking the top 20 people at ra to play at your place having them you know charge you an exorbitant rate because they don't know you from adam or eve having them turn up and they're not getting a return on your money just because you went to have the flyer say xyz it's just not a smart way to go about things that, that's be another way to kind of maneuver so that will be interesting to see and again we might see the abundance of new pop-up clubs as well happening that might be cool remember the few years ago there was a few of those happening all over the place they had like little temporary licenses that they kind of you know set up shopping and did events in um so especially before the end of the year we had loads of stories appearing on press publications on publications in general saying oh the advent of the rise of warehouse right all these kids are doing all these crazy cool events don't think those are going to stop right they'll get even more prevalent especially if people don't have any money the first place they're going to go to is the place where you can kind of byob right or make a donation at the door um those will be the places that will get most of the love and then it will kind of you know go to the other zone but i think that's what's going to happen that's the future i predict in the electronic music space so let's move on here what else we got to talk about talking about electronic music unfortunately junction 2 is cancelled um just got that news in earlier on today actually via email which was always a bad thing in it but hey what can you do this is an interesting development i think because of the dates I would assume the fact that, because I'm sure it's not, it's a, 
it is, it's a park, so I'm assuming they'd have to set up, especially a public park, they'd have to set up shop maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a month in advance, right, in Bossa Manor. So that would require, so even though it's, it's in June, it would require them setting up probably or getting things sorted before the end of April or maybe, I don't know, maybe not April, maybe maybe the middle of May. That would require them to set up everything and get things, you know, make sure they've got all the necessary equipment. I don't know, maybe that's, or maybe just in general, they don't have the ha the construction people to set up things up, which I don't think is true. I think mostly it's just a, a maintenance thing, right? I'd assume so, but who knows? But this is a post from the Junction team who kind of, you know, uh, lay out the letter of the law and what's actually going on. I think they mentioned they had a bit of an impasse with the local council, but let's read the entire, I forgot what they said, so... Fifth anniversary, first of all, postponed until June 21. So it's fifth, fifth anniversary, I never knew that, right? So until next year, um, so June 2021. So it's following in depth discussions with the local council and emergency services, we have decided to postpone Junction 2's fifth anniversary to the 4th and 5th of June next summer. We plan to replicate the lineup like for like, um, which is great news, I guess, mostly because it shows that they've obviously cultivated a good reputation, reputation with the promoters, with, sorry, with the booking people. With the booking agents and the artists themselves i think mostly if you didn't like the event and you didn't want to go and this happened you would probably be a good time to kind of get out of it i don't know fuck that i'm not gonna do it next year but a lot of people have a good lot to say about it um junction and houghton get a lot of good reviews a lot of good feedback from the artists that actually play there especially some of the more jaded ones who are always a bit bitter about what's happening in the scene they usually always have good things to say about junction too so that is obviously a good thing for them um it says uh we have spent recent weeks extensively exploring the option of moving the festival to a later date however given the government's position with emergency services uh may not support major events combined with the strain that it will place on our public services over the coming months it will be irresponsible for us to risk uh, adding any additional burden to nhs and emergency service which is really good because i think there is has been a bit of an assault on the nhs prior to the tory government being re-elected or prior to judge to Boris johnson being re-elected uh or being elected in the first place and the kind of tide has turned a little bit since the pandemic. People are a little bit more understanding, a little bit symptomatic. They have a lot more goodwill towards people working in the NHS. So to put this event on with the amount of um, police force that's needed to kind of make sure it doesn't, you know, go crazy, medical departments. And for the most part, you know, if you've ever been to a, a festival in London, you'll know that, you know, London people are the worst at pacing. They're the worst at taking it easy in places they go way too hard and you know they actually do exhaust the resources when it comes to medical services so there's a good call in that one but if you read in between the lines there is a little bit of, of me that thinks they were willing to put it on if they were able to get the okay from the local government i mean from the council and from the government in terms of having the reassurances that they would have a medical team on site willing and able to help them I think the fact that they weren't able to confirm that, because if they wanted to, they probably could get a private clinic to sponsor it and do something with them. Maybe I'm not too sure legally if that's a, if that's something that you can do with a public event or the pub event in a public space, even for ticket or not. I'm not too sure, but there is a part of it that's like they probably could have put it on if they got the okay, but then they probably didn't want to go through with it because they didn't want the bad stick or the you know ruin the reputation for the sake of a weekend and you could just postpone it to next year. Um, Again, it depends. You would view it as cancelling if it's next year. Maybe it's postponing, but I still think it's postponing. I think doing it any other time apart from June, especially in London, is just asking for trouble. Um, the weather will turn on you in a dime. You know, we have a general saying here in London that you don't, ever, you never, you don't ever not go out without some kind of hoodie, some kind of scarf or hoodie or woolly hat because you never know what's going to happen. So that's probably a good option in terms of you know trying to imagine if they try to put it on in July and then suddenly you know a tsunami hit. Um, then you'll be really pissed off. So that's probably a good idea. And they continue to hear, so we'd like to take this opportunity to express our deepest appreciation and respect for those um, confronting this emergency. We'd also like to thank everyone for the phenomenal support shown to Johnson too. This summer's installment was set to be the most successful with the strongest lineup of in our history. Definitely agree with that one. And the majority of tickets already sold. We have spent the last five years working to build Junction 2 up to the much loved event that it is today. To not see the fifth anniversary come to fruition has been extremely tough. However, as the well being of our staff, crew, and artists and attendees are number one priority, there is no alternative for us to book than to postpone, which I definitely agree with. And kudos to them for taking that decision because no, not everyone's doing that. So props to them. 
We look forward to seeing you all next June when we will return stronger than before. Uh, by holding on to the ticket of 2021 festival, you'll be securing your attendance next year's festival. You cannot join us next year. You can get a face value of your ticket refunded via the ticket outlet you purchased it from. Please contact them directly for this refunds will be available until the 30th of April, which is awesome. Um, we also announced our plans to mark our June festival weekend this summer with a very special online event for the LZV. Huh. We also, okay, so that's so, so that's pretty cool. So first bit there, there isn't there is obviously an indication. I think again, I would reserve this kind of attitude or goodwill to places that you actually support and you like what they do. But I'm of the opinion if you had a ticket booked for a festival this year and they're postponing it for a later date, I would really um advise against or encourage against kind of trying to get a refund for something that you were going to go to in the summer as a festival with your friends just hold on to it until you they confirm the new date or if it's going to be performed next year just hold on to it next year you're buying it ahead of time by the time that event swings by you'll be gracious or over the moon that you have it you never know what the demand will be like the next year things might change um, just hold on to it support the people that put these events on because if everyone floods then we'll refund requests at the same time there's no guarantee that they haven't already spent that money that they already got from the pre-sale of the tickets on producing the show they're probably going to be out of pocket for having to postpone it insurance all these sort of things come in and i'm sure i haven't put on you know events on a much lower level than this i know how much money goes into putting these events and most of the time people that are doing it aren't necessarily doing it to make a buck they're usually doing it because they want to add to the legacy of the city they're from they want to just put on a fun party they've got spare cash to burn it's usually never like a money-making scheme for the most part unless you've obviously got a club and you know a relationship with the place that's different but for the most part if you're putting on these large-scale events especially in london with the amount of red tape they have to go through and hoops have to jump through it probably isn't a money-making scheme so if you support these guys and you like what they do then definitely hold on to a ticket and get a refund but if you can they're obviously making it really easy in terms of contacting a ticket um, partner and getting that done but I also like the bit at the end about hosting an online I'm assuming a live DJ stream thing with some of the people that were meant to play doing it at Junction now this could be a great idea because it allows people to kind of you know have some level of fun in their house with it and also could be good because you never know what the climate will be like by the end by the beginning of June right it could be a totally different climate they're in they might be able to imagine they are able to live stream it and instead of going to the festival you can maybe go to the pub again and someone plays it in their pub via the tv screens or whatever that would be pretty cool um there's loads of different avenues someone might host it someone might do hosting parties around the house people might come over when the kind of um the stip the guidelines are, are kind of lessened and softened a little bit there's loads of scope there so i really like the idea and hopefully we'll get to see what that lineup will look like in terms of who they can kind of rope in to do it because of course you know it's a quite a busy time period obviously they have the benefit because people are not traveling back and forth but hopefully they're able to secure some big acts that were meant to be playing there that'd be a good one but um yeah disappointing to see but obviously understandable too considering everything that's going on but yeah that's junction two it's postponed until 2021 next on the list here let's route through a couple others da, 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 da. Uh, 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 what else we have here i want to talk about what is it oh, yeah, got, yeah cool so this is an interesting article here i think maybe end on this one which is quite cool um Budget did an interview with Esquire and he sort of kind of clarified his statements about streetwear is impending death. I'm sure you might have seen those comments kind of said off off the cuff, you know, when his interview was dazed that people kind of got a bit crazy over. But, you know, this is part of his MO, social media king, reaction king in that regard. But he kind of clarified a little bit with Esquire, which is a weird place to go to to kind of clarify your statements on streetwear. But hey, what could you do? This title says here, 50 Virgil clarifies his statement about streetwear's impending death, right? So this is an article um that will link again to show us you guys to check out by a guy called gerard gerald flores so this is the following here it says if you ask virgil Abloh, 2020 um is the year of streetwear officially dies right given that abo is currently at the top of streetwear mount olympia uh, olympus sorry echoes of his prediction reverberate through the internet raising some degree of alarm among streetwear disciples is he just uh, being an alarmist or does he see something we don't he clarified exactly what he meant by his comment this past December, which he still stands by. So this is the following. It's 50-50. I said it as a means to provoke the industry that we all love, which is, you know, is what it is. Um, 
the Ablo Ablohemian way of looking at the shirts and sneakers and the apparel that he and his other designers like him make is to treat them like an art movement. Except instead of the Baroque period in the 1600s, streetwear and Renaissance man has can be traced back to New York's Lower East Side in the early aughts when shops like Nom de Guerre, A Life, and Prohibit were at the height of the influence here. Definitely because references there. Now they're defunct or a shell of their former selves. It just reminds me that most people skipped there over the history lesson that got us here today. He says, if we want to do the future streetwear to not just, if we want the the future streetwear to not just become this mainstream thing that can be easily replicated, then us that care about it or are of streetwear need to make it as great as possible, not formulaic, which is weird. I don't know why he's saying this. this is, hmm. So he's challenging everybody to make better stuff by saying it's going to die but he didn't actually say it's going to die if we just continue making better stuff he said it's already dead it's going to be a new thing and i guess this was this was part of his kind of there's been a concerted effort it feels like from what i've seen from yasser looking especially from the fashion types to kind of poo poo streetwear's influence put it to one side and then kind of lift up this return of tailoring right um as somehow because you know they're saying oh people people on streetwear can't tailor right they can't cut a suit jacket they can't cut a skirt all this sort of nonsense okay cool whatever but dismissing one thing while raising up the other doesn't um doesn't doesn't kind of uh relate to what's happening on the runway right you look at the runway people are still designing sneakers there's still loads of baseball caps there's still t-shirts there's still denim there's still hoodie parkers there's still you know all these things still exist on the runway and they will continue to exist because we've finally got a position where you know fashion has always been a bit fuddy daddy right i've always kind of believe that even when I'm, though I'm a fan of it it's always been a bit up his own ass but I think the advent of street style especially for the most part and then the bloggers and then the influencers and then streetwear and then kind of the, the kind of overall underlying um, infatuation that fashion people have with skateboarding has allowed or birthed this kind of renaissance in streetwear right it's allowed them to kind of really be adjacent to the community because it felt like I, there was a period in time where when Paris Fashion Week men's was going on or Paris in general people all that agenda in LA right or in bread and butter in Berlin they want in Paris fashion week shows but now you can see the this the you know this whole synergy between both industries because usually when the men's shows are showing in Paris everyone goes and does their showroom in Paris too right all the streetwear brands because usually they're you know uh, usually aimed at male demographic you know between the ages of like say 14 and 58 and they all go and flood over there because that's where most of the buyers for all the big retail st for the big kind of merch retail stores for men stuff like Essence, Tresbian, um, and uh, Mr. Porter. All those guys are there anyway, seeing the show so they can pass through your show at the same time. So you know it's to kill two birds with one stone. And obviously you can you know smooth winding down some of the fashion types so a little bit more loose with the older company card. So they love to, so in public they're saying that streetwear is done, but the reality is the runways are still flooded with kind of streetwear influence items. And like I said, I think fashion primarily is mostly, is mostly kind of geared, yeah, I say fashion, it, the capital F is mostly geared towards women. Style is mostly geared towards guys. And guys for the most part lend themselves towards streetwear. But then now it's flipped where a lot of women are now kind of embracing the idea of kind of a relaxed way of looking right they're not trying to look like Anna de la Russo they don't want to wear head to toe come the gossip runway looks to their office job somewhere right um it's not practical but they do want to be comfortable and they do want to be chic so they're adopting some of those methodologies too so to say that it's dead or it's going to die is a uh, you know a defunct statement to say that you're challenging people is a defunct statement too because how many you know merch is a good example band or music merch is essentially quote unquote you know it's like it's like a one or it's like streetwear 101 merch isn't it long sleeves hoodies t-shirts and hats like you can't get more quintessentially streetwear than merch stuff and that covers the gamut between heavy metal to hip-hop it just covers every single kind of genre so it will never die if those things are still around um and again, I don't think people need to be challenged because they're already making. Because already, if you look at it, most for the most part, most brands want to get their stuff on like Dover Street, right? So by proxy, you want you're gonna want to have your stuff look comparable to or better than the stuff that's already on there. So there's a different mindset that people like. You know, back in the day when people had, were getting their stuff stocked on, I don't know, Karma Loop, 
right? The aesthetic and the taste level was of a Karma Loop level, right? You're competing with Karma Loop brands, but now you're competing with Trez BM brands and Trez BM's own label. You're competing with Essence's own label, the essentials. All these things are kind of eating at your kind of market share. So if you're a brand now, you can't just come out, come out of the game with two kind of prints and a basic hoodie. You're going to have to do something else to kind of separate yourselves, but you're still coming from the ethos of the street with it, right? So I don't know, that, that quote was a bit weird. Anyway, continue to say, said, some may find a foreboding proclamation like this coming from him confusing, polarizing, or maybe even offensive, but I believe it isn't completely wrong. Everything from fad to human condition comes to an end eventually. Obviously, you've got this gay picture of them two wearing the same jacket, which is, you know, I don't really understand, but on the court, he looks better than Drake because Drake can't really dress that well. Continue to say, um, what trend on earth exists that doesn't die? He said, it's a real intellectual question. Not really. No, it's not intellectual. It's just a question that people can answer. And, you know, all trends end like civilizations end, isn't it? Uh, so if we love this culture of ours, you need to think about it. It's like disco. People thought that it was going to last forever. Do you see disco around today? No. Yes, you do, though. That's the thing. This, this guy is a little bit, is a little bit TikTok, isn't it, when it comes to these kind of things? That's definitely, it's definitely like his worldview he thinks is echoed in the grand scheme of things like hasn't he heard of future boogie does he not know god jansen's one of the biggest djs in the world and he plays loads of disco crystal clear to like there's loads of good even just a soul train uh party they put on um in peckham that happens i think once a month is maybe one of their most well-attended parties that they put on right horse meat disco are still touring the world it just inputs like you know didn't the weekend put out an album that's inspired by that kind of 80s synth pop i tell a disco sort of feel um daft punk are essentially what they're kind of kids of that whole glam rock um abba uh kind of scene so to say that it's dead or that that's not around today is dumb like everyone's playing it you know you don't have to go to i'm sure some of those swanky Parisian after parties, maybe for Elizabeth, Isabel Moran or something. I don't think they're going to get a DJ in playing hip hop and, hit and heavy metal. They're going to be playing, or maybe heavy metal, or maybe playing folk and disco stuff because, you know, they're all twirly French girls. I like to spin around in circles and do that white girl dance. So to say it's dead is completely wrong. Right? It just goes to show his scope of understanding of the dance music scene, scene is quite limited. Maybe he means in terms of the customers that buy streetwear. Like, you know, if they're quintessential hip hop kids, will they be listening to, are they going to be listening to the new Tiger and Woods EP? Probably not, but people, other people are. I know I do and I wear hoodies, so. This is one of the biggest grievances that says the state of the culture is the tornado spin cycle, the releases that's meant to entice pipe beast to lust after shoes on a weekly basis. Even though he's been behind some of the most lusty, uh, worthy sneakers of the last few years, Ablo also points out another um, carcinogen, what? Carcinogen. Carcinogen to streetwear can be found in a comment section. <laughs> this is funny. So when the first... When first looks of his Jordan 5 collab hit the internet, it was lambasted by the trolls with the itchy Twitter, Twitter fingers. Um, Abla saw every negative comment about his shoe and made a point to remind him, to remind his detractors on his release date, which is, you know, which is a good little flex, I think. Um, I think he posted it on here. Let's see if we can get that up there. I think he reminded everyone about people requesting it. But again, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think prior to these shoes coming out, I think it was common not, not common knowledge but it was a widely accepted truth amongst people that buy jordans that the fives weren't that great right um it says here lol i remember all those that said the fives were whack right but now they obviously are, are texting him and wanting to have his shoe cool don't get me wrong that's a nice little humble flex but i don't think you can get cock on your station because widely most fans i remember even the time when fairfax london was wearing a lot of fives um, he was really the only one wearing them, right? A few other sneakerheads, but they're not the most easy shoe to wear, especially for kids nowadays who wear. Maybe now, because people are wearing like flared out trousers, but back in the day, or maybe a few months ago when it was a bit more of a slimmer silhouette, those shoes are way too chunky. The tongue is really strange. They're hard to lace in a good way. Um, it's just not like even the way he's laced them up here, they're not the most easy shoe to just to kind of rock. So the people don't like them mainly because of that. And if you have the one, you have the twos, you have the threes and the fours. Um, it's very difficult to justify getting a five, right? In terms of looks wise, especially when you skip over the fives, you go to a six that look, you know, considerably better in terms of paneling and shape. They just look a bit bizarre. They look sort of like a low top that's got a mid foot added on top of it. How kind of the laces go all the way to the back. There's not that kind of triangle shape to them. So I don't think that was a bad suggestion. That was a bad call by people i guess when they once they saw them in person and worn a little bit they kind of got a bit of hype and again i just think in general like if you put out a sandal 
with fucking sandal written in quotation marks they'd sell out too but it's not necessarily an indication of the is the shoes good it's just a reflection on the level of hype he's able to kind of generate his product which is great for him but again i don't think it's a point to raise in that context but maybe it's just me but i, I think in general I don't know, leave leave a comment below let me know but I, I don't think people actually give a shit about jordan vibes until these came out anyway and mostly they gave shit about them because they would resell them and because they're limited edition and you can flex on people and it continues here says there was a presiding opinion that they were whack now everyone's mad that they can't get them i obviously don't care mm. yes you do because you're mentioning it and you tweeted about it he said that in abelo's estimation sneakers are more like sculptures that you find in a museum okay this is getting wanky less trademarks of hype sneakers are actually part of his first solo show museum exhibition figures of speech at chicago's mta that he likens himself to the oh okay it's gonna get a bit wanky it says here um here's a quote from it says this is for me and my own narration design says the same way that uh van der van, van der Rohe, um was making his own catalog of ideas for his own imagination for me it's so much the same thing obviously i think from the perspective of the kids from the comments too because i'm i'm that kid that wasn't given an opportunity to design i don't think the kids commenting on the comments i don't think the kids that that say anything in the comments or chat shit about him unless several kids that don't get an opportunity to design i think anyone can nowadays right you just need a you know you need one of these a couple of ideas maybe half a day with you know with a sketch pad you can make something yourself i think they're just calling shit out because they realize the circle jerk that exists in every industry every industry has a bit of a circle jerk around people that are kind of propping it up and kind of bringing the most amount of eyes and money to that scene because you know everyone's kind of eating off of it right if he's successful everyone around him gets success as well they get paid they get looks so it's only common sense that they're gonna wank him off and make it seem everything he touches a genius because it propagates or pepperish pe perpetuates this idea that he's one so that someone someone you know with a bit of sense that wants to hire a team of people would then look at the person left to the right of him and get them involved too so those kids are calling stuff in the comments some of them may be trolls it's so true some of them could be failed or disgruntled designers but for the most part it's just kids that are calling that stuff that they see in it the clothes don't really hit that well the shoes are his best thing that he does um the fives weren't that good of a shoe in general then he puts his name to it he's able to do a good flip on them they get seen in person in real life it would always changes stuff i think even back in the day i knew it from the times of crooked times where you see like an image of a leaked picture of a shoe from a line sheet but you see it in real life it completely changes how you actually view it so that is nothing to really write home about so i don't know it's a strange thing to say but anyway um, so it said now that i have it he says i express it by putting my idea on the table not by commenting on others ideas like this which is a fair enough statement i think if you're in this position you are a prolific worker you do put out a lot of stuff right he is smashing out the collaboration smashing out the content you know fingers in different sort of pies it can be a bit disheartening to see people who haven't done jack shit tearing your thing apart after giving it one second look or brief but i guess that's just part and parcel of the world we live in it is what it is you you know on one side of things you have people kind of you know saying you're the malcolm x or whatever and on the other side of things you have people saying you know you're only there because you're kind of mate those things are both not true but they are what they are in it there's nothing really you can do about that one nicotine tears is ultimately i is looking is looking beyond creating the next big ticket item for resale market and looking for the next generation of designers who will eventually who will ultimately be responsible for the life and death of streetway says i want to inspire kids to create so take the criticism of my product and make the and take the criticism of any other designer and make something just don't sit and critique which i definitely agree i think that's a very poignant bit to kind of end on right the idea that you shouldn't just be looking at what he does and because actually the white ones are really good actually um and just pointing fingers and saying oh this shit is bad which it might be but i guess again it, it depends i don't know most people that are actually making stuff probably don't have time to sit down and comment probably let's say that but if they are they're not commenting because they can't make stuff they're commenting because they're just you know you have eyes and you see stuff you have fingers you can type why not leave a comment it's not i don't necessarily see the bad thing about that back i guess people are a bit annoyed with comments because they're public because they're news they're usually news items when we were commenting on forums no one seemed to care people used to jump in forums all the time even back in the day when they had display forums for the, the, the designers they used to or i think they still designed the supreme website had their own little private um forum thing that you got invited to and people used to say the wild shit on there and there'd be people that own brands on there hypey's forums are the same probably hundreds used to go on there all the time and kind of you know plead his case with people that are ripping his brand to pieces but that was okay but now suddenly if you comment on a news piece on hypey's oh, on high snobby you're some disgruntled kid but i don't think that's a really fair accurate uh, characterization but again i do appreciate the idea that you know if you are out there and you're a kid and you think his stuff isn't that great 
you know th- th- there's never been a better time to do your own thing you know you have no real excuse you save up a bit of money from your part-time job you flip a couple of trainers and suddenly you too can have your own you know um psych ward or you know um sicko brand whatever it may be out there pumping stuff out and doing little limited drops it's not really that difficult to do anymore and there are no real excuses anymore as well in that regard because the barrier of entry is so low which is great for everyone to get involved in but yeah that is from esquire i'll link it again showing if you guys to check out a full article on him kind of defending himself regarding some of the criticisms he might have got for that comment anyway that's it been an hour thanks so much for tuning in this is the next English episode number 298 as per usual if you're watching this via youtube hit this like button smash subscribe leave me a comment leave me know what you think of the show if you're watching via the podcast app of course five star review share it with all your friends and family um you can also find more details regarding myself on my website xenosingo.com be down below in the show notes descriptions you'll be able to find links to my blog to my social media handles and all that sort of good stuff if you're listening to my dj mixes they'll be available there too just click on the um, mixes I will link you to my sound card. You see all the good stuff that I play there going forward. Um, but until then, take care, be safe, and I'll see you guys again tomorrow.